Um, I'm Harold James. Uh, I'm a financial historian of, at the policy school here and uh, in the history department. It's an enormous pleasure uh, to welcome you to this uh, seminar webinar uh, that's co-hosted by the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies uh, and of course by the uh, Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Um, uh, C C Catherine Pistor is the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia Law School and Director of the Center there uh, on Global Legal Transformation. And she's done an enormous amount of really interesting research on corporate governance, uh, money, finance, property rights, comparative law, law and development. Uh, she's the author of many, many articles, uh, co-author of several books, including Law and Capitalism, What Corporate Crises Reveal About Legal Systems and Economic Development Around the World, and the co-editor also of Governing Access to Essential Resources, obviously an issue that is uh, right at the center of a lot of attention in the middle of the COVID crisis. But we're here to talk, uh, she's here to talk about her most recent book, um, The Code of Capital, How the Law Creates Wealth and Inequality, uh, that came out a, a few months ago uh, from Princeton uh, University Press. Um, it's, 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 it's really great to have you here. It's, it's a wonderful book about uh, really on the intersection of uh, law, economics, finance. There's also a lot of history in it um, because it's, it's, a, it's a historical argument in, in, in essence. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be able to listen to what you're going to say and I'm sure everybody else is. Thank you so much, Katerina, for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. So let me try to sh share my screen so I can walk you through my slides. Um, I hope this works for everyone. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk uh, to you about this book. Uh, I should mention that um, the book is going to come out as a paperback version in early November. So if you want to save a few bucks, um, it will become a little cheaper in a month or two uh, from now. Um, let me just introduce you to, to the basic argument. This is how it looks like in both paperback and hardcover. So one of the core issues I'm trying to do in the book is basically re-ask a question that has been on many people's minds and not only since Marx, but before then as well, which is what is capital? And I basically define capital as an asset that has the capacity to generate wealth and maybe even protect wealth for its holders. And what, what I'm basically arguing in order to generate or protect wealth, an ordinary object and just a thing, or a promise to payments or an idea needs to have certain types of attributes. And here are the four attributes that are used throughout the book to show you how law is coding capital. So the first attribute is that the holder of an asset must have priority rights over others. So you, we are ranking rights in the law. And if you have stronger rights, you have a better claim than if you have weaker rights. So priority is key. The second um, attribute, which is much less talked about, but is crucial in my story, is what I call durability, which basically extends certain rights, including the priority rights I've been talking about, in time. It gives the holders of assets an ability to shield their assets from too many different claimants and also shield them against the immediate fallout, let's say, from economic disaster. Never complete, never complete, but always relative to other asset holders, um, it's, it's a better protection. The third attribute is really key, and this will link up to why it's actually the law that must do the work, is universality, uh, which basically means that the priority or durability claims are not contingent, not dependent on you making a, a, a deal with everybody else, which would be enormously costly and probably prohibitively costly. So, But you have a state that basically enforces these uh, claims against the world, ergo omnes, as the lawyers would like uh, like to say in, 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 in Latinese. And, and so universality basically ensures that there are certain types of claims that once they are recognized in law will be enforced against anybody, whether or not they have been part to the deal in the first place. The last attribute is really important for financial assets, which have become our most important assets for generating wealth in our own days. Um, uh, whether we can hold them is, a, is, 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 is really contingent on convertibility. You could basically say that convertibility is how financial assets attain durability and how 
do you do that? Well, you don't protect them physically because financial assets are, um, uh, you know, just ephemeral in some ways. But what you can do is you can give their holders an option to convert their assets into safer assets. And as you know, in times of financial crisis, everybody's heading for the door. And what do they want? They want to have dollars or maybe euros, dollars, yen, Swiss francs, some of the leading currencies. They want to have state issued legal tender, not privately issued assets um, and convertibility if they have direct um, access to the central bank to a leading central bank or if they have an option to convert their assets into safer assets with a private investor they're better off than everybody else so these are the four key attributes and i'm basically arguing in the book that by bestowing by grafting these attributes onto different types of assets whether it's an object whether it's an, a promise or whether it's an idea we are creating uh, capital Okay, so why law? What is, what, what is the job or the work that law really does here? Um, what I'm, ask, I'm arguing is basically that what law gives those who are holding these assets and, and of course the lawyers who are grafting these attributes onto these assets, they give them enforceability, which basically reduces the cost of making sure that they can really hold on to these rights and facilitate scaling by which I mean that you can have economic relations with people you have never met before. You can trade in global markets with folks on the other side of the globe because you can rely on the enforceability of these claims. Whether or not you actually ever enforce a secondary, but the enforceability is key. So in a way, capital holders are harnessing a social resource, which is the centralized means of coercion, state power, which has been institutionalized as law. The critical point here is that law has multiple dimensions. And I think for lay people who have never dealt with the law, especially not with private law, it's really important to understand that law is not only an instrument that the state can use in a top-down fashion to govern its people, it is not even limited to the fact, which is still an astonishing fact, is that citizens can use the law, which is of the state, to protect themselves against that state with the institutions that the state has provided, such as courts. But what I'm mostly interested in in this book is actually the horizontal relationship between you and me, between citizens, who can avail themselves of the legal systems to organize their relations with one another and against third parties. That's what this book is really all about. And this is um, really the, the, the work that private law does. So private law is law too, because it's backed by the state. The core institutions of private law that I identified as crucial to the coding of capital for the last several centuries is property law, collateral law, which is a part of property law, the law of the common law trust, corporate law, bankruptcy law and contract law is the glue that you use to stitch together other claims and sometimes to mimic or replicate the attributes that property or collateral law or trust law can have. Contract law is limited in principle because you can only contract with another party and you by definition if you use contract law you can't impose obligations on third parties who are not part of the deal. But with information technology, if you think about all the agreements that you sign on it every day when you go online, you can see that we can scale contractual relations such that they're almost akin to property law. So I call these six legal institutions of private law the modules of the code of capital. They're not the only ones. You can point to others, but I, I, I'm arguing in the book that these have been the critical um, modules, legal modules for coding capital um, for the past couple of centuries. And in the book, I then apply that framework to the coding of capital of different types of assets. So I call any object, any claim to future payment or promise to future payment um, um, or an organization that is able sort of to harness legal power to operate as an organization or oh, know how I call them collectively assets. And I'm showing how they have been coded in the different legal modules. The book starts from land, goes to firms, debt and know-how. I'm not suggesting that there is a um, sequential story here, although one could argue, and, and, and Bernard Rudden, a legal historian from Oxford who died in 2015, he has argued in a, um, in a paper in 1994 that everything starts with land. So I have a wonderful quote in the book where he says, property law was really invented during the age of feudalism. 
And what people don't realize is that it's basically still alive and kicking. And today its most important domain is not land, but it's what he calls funds, it's finance. And that's basically in a nutshell what this book is really all about is following Rudden's path and showing exactly how this has been done over uh, several centuries. So I thought for the purpose of this presentation, I will limit myself to, to, to land and debt. And I will also say just a few words about um, the digital code, uh, which I um, discuss in the context of asking whether or not the legal code might be replaced by the digital code. And then I will come to um, some of the broader governance issues that my book raises, in particular, the role of lawyers, the role of globalization and, 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 and the relationship between coding capital and democratic self-governance. So coding land, everybody has heard about land enclosures um, going back to the 16th century in England. Most of the enclosure of the land was actually not done by the big parliamentary acts. They followed only at the end of the centuries long land enclosure movement. Much of the struggle between the commoners and the landlords took place in litigation and took place in the fields. So at some point the landlords basically claimed that they had better rights over the land than commoners and could exclude them from the land. They could basically not open the gates again for the commoners to graze their cattle. They could use the land to grow cash crops or to um, uh, graze their sheep in order to have uh, wool for the textile production that was taking off. And so the question was, who was right? Because the commoners came back and they tore down the fences and tore down the hedges and tried to claim the land as theirs. In the end, the issues were settled in court. And uh, we have um, increasing evidence of, of hundreds, if not thousands of court cases, which went back and forth. I don't want to paint the story that the landlords or the asset holders or the, the sort of the high ones, the better resourced, always won. They very often lost, but in the long term, they did win. And they won mostly with an argument of seniority. They basically claimed whether or not they had the best evidence for that is a second uh, matter, but they basically claimed and succeeded to convince the courts that ultimately they had been there first and had the longer rights and that they had only granted um, rights to the commoners, which they were free to take away again. There's another issue here, which uh, Frank Appam at NYU Law School has uh, pointed out, is that sometimes the commoners were also denied standing in a court of law, which basically means that you can't fight for your rights. And if the rights are decided in court, then you have um, uh, no options really to defend your claims either. So that's the second strand uh, you could bring to bear here. Then later on, when we take the land enclosure to um, the settlers colonies of North America, of New Zealand or Australia, obviously the new settlers could hardly claim there that they had come first. It was too obvious that they had been first people on these, um, uh, in these territories. So the argument shifted and the core argument with which they won, again, vis-a-vis -vis, um, indigenous people, in court, courts had been established to resolve their disputes or vis-a-vis -vis just claims they made uh, to, to, to the local authorities is that they had improved the land. They had basically mingled as John Locke, who was an official for the uh, British colonizers in North America had argued, they had mingled their labor power, their labor force with an asset with land and that gave them property rights. And since the first people had not done something similar, at least so the argument went, they didn't have a similar claim. So here you can see how with, of course, additional arguments about seniority and improvement, you make a claim for priority, right? My first attribute of the code of, uh, of, the, of, the code of capital. Um, the priority arguments that we see here, in particular the improvement argument um, has very powerful parallels in the second enclosure movement, which is the enclosure of knowledge, intellectual property rights, and what we could call the third enclosure movement, the enclosure of our data that is currently underway. And I will say a few more words about this um, later on, especially about the data. Um, what is interesting though, that priority alone, that is property rights alone, don't give you a winning option for capital because you can lose property. One of the functionalities of property is once you own, you can also decide that you give your asset that you own as a collateral to obtain funding from creditors, right? And people like Atanando de Soto and others have said, we can actually lift people out of poverty by giving them title to their houses and then they use the house as collateral and get a loan and then they can build a business and they can win. The problem is um, you, also can lose. You can lose your house and you can lose your shirt and you can lose everything because the creditors can seize the land if you can't pay your loan. 
So that dependence is a threat to your property rights, to your capital that you want to um, accumulate over time. So what the English landlords learned with the help of their lawyers is that, is that they could entail the land. They basically said, oh, the owner doesn't really own the land. He only holds the land on behalf of future generations. Therefore, the creditors, even secured creditors, cannot take all of the land away from them. Even secured creditors could take at most 50% of the land and never the family mansion. So this is durability. You're creating a legal structure. It's very close to a common law trust that helps you separate the assets of an individual from the assets held on behalf of others, on the beneficiaries, the future generations, and thereby you can basically prevent creditors from having access to them. That's what corporate law does. As a legal person, you can separate the assets of the corporation from the assets of the shareholders and their personal creditors. That's what the trust does, which is why the trust is one of the most um, widely used institutions for tax avoidance um, uh, schemes all the way to the family office, as it's nowadays called. Now, so they entailed the land in England, but note that when they also tried to entail the land in North America, the English parliament adopted a law in 1732, the Debt Recovery Act, and basically said, no, you can't do this in North America. We will treat land as we end slaves as chattel property, which basically means we can enforce against that without your, uh, you being um, able to protect these assets against us. That gave rise, as Claire Priest has shown in her own work, to the first um, slave auctions. That gave rise to some busting of big estates in the southern states. Uh, some of them were reconstituted later on in the early 19th century by similar structures like the entail trust structures and others, but the immediate effect was to um, downscale uh, land as a major source of wealth. And you can see this actually in, in two slides, um, which I have um, taken from Piketty's book um, from 2014, to, um, Capital in the 21st Century. He has a chapter there on the metamorphosis of capital. And for me, this was so interesting and one of the reasons why I wrote the book, um, because he showed in data how the assets that are the most important source of wealth. The capital assets have changed over time, but the only explanation he gives us about this is um, change in technology and demand and supply, the classic economic type of um, arguments that you would see. But when I looked at the slide, I thought, wow, land declined as an important source of wealth, agricultural land, the big black box here down here, um, in the uh, late 19th century. That's exactly when in England, the system blew up, this entailed land system, and there was a major depression in agriculture and um, a major reform, legal reform came forward in 1881 that said, we will treat land as chattel and we will not respect your entail. We cut through this legal fiction and we will take away the land. That's how land ended up on the auction block. Now look at North America, you see that the flattening out of land as the most important source of assets much, much earlier than that. And I think that could be attributed to the Debt Recovery Act of 1732. Okay, so let me give you a second um, example just to basically flesh it out a little bit. And I thought I'll, I'll talk about debt because one of the major sources for creating ever more debt has been land again, right? Think about the mortgage-backed securities and the story that we have see, uh, seen unfold or implode really in 2008. Um, so asset-backed securities are really claims to future payments that are backed by some kind of an asset. And that gives the creditor the option to use this asset, seize the asset from the debtor and enforce against it if the debtor cannot pay the loan. So you basically have two claims. They're linked, but they're two. You have a claim against the debtor to pay. If the debtor can't pay, you have the asset as a stopgap measure. So an asset-backed security is basically based on a contractual promise to pay one of my modules. It is backed by a collateral, another module. Um, it is transfers typically to a trust or other corporate entity to separate the asset that is protecting the creditor um, uh, from the, the debtor's other, other assets. So here we have um, basically a durability um, aspect again, and then we are creating a legal, div um, a, a legal structure again through the trust to make the um, ultimate debtor um, separate from the claims against the asset pool. So the asset pools are what lawyers like to call bankruptcy remote from the trust sponsor. I'll show you the slide here in a second, how this works. So think about how home, homeowners in California 
who basically received a loan from uh, New Century, that was the loan originator, New Century blew up in 2007, went bankrupt, but it originated a lot of loans, gave them the money and took a mortgage to secure the loan. It then bought them um, up from many, many different, or used many, many loans that had originated from the homeowners and sold them wholesale to city. City is here, just a simplified structure. It has many, many different affiliates and had a spe special affiliate that would use then these um, uh, claims, the loans backed by mortgages and throw them behind the wheel of a trust because this trust is legally separate from city and so you create bankruptcy remoteness here and then you issue interest in the trust to all kinds of different investors which i have sort of identified here who these were in a particular derivative structure or, or asset backed security structure that i discuss in the book i don't have to go into the details here i just want to flag the fact that this is a really international exercise so land is one of the most local immovable assets that you can think of and yet by packaging them in law and legal devices we can create claims to land that are traded globally right and then on top of the securitization structure we can also create uh, collateralized debt obligations basically by taking some of the tranches in the trust packaging them again into a corporate entity this time around in the cayman island um, the whole thing is underwritten by a major international bank in this case ubs and again you have all kinds of of, of note holders who buy these assets at every step along the way of ownership you have collateral, you have trust, you have a corporate entity, and you have claims to future pay that investors can claim are relatively secure because they're backed by some asset. What's the asset? Well, the cash flow that is coming in from the homeowners who have to pay their loans on a, on a regular basis. That was the foundation for what we call also shadow banking because asset-backed securities are used not only for mortgages but for all kinds of other uh, debt instruments. We're basically creating a collateral and thereby enticing investors to buy many of these assets. So as I was writing the book, I just I was always thinking about this movie, The Matrix. Many of um, of you may have watched that. There were a lot of philosophical debates in the 1990s um, about um, ab about that movie as well. And I just felt like the the legal code has basically um, created a complex system of which we're all part and are contributing, but in a way that we very often don't understand how it really operates. And of course, um, once you're there, you also make the next move and say, well, what about the digital code really? And the question I asked myself in the book is whether the digital code might actually replace the legal code at some point in time. We're seeing smart contracts. We're seeing digital autonomous organization. The DAO crashed, one Ethernet-based entity, but others are on the way. We have digital currencies um, from Bitcoins to, to many others. Um, concepts even like the Libra to create a global uh, currency was promoted last year. It's still out there. We haven't seen the, um, the end of day yet, but it has been slowed considerably. Um, and then, of course, the rights to data, something I don't explicitly um, uh, discuss in the book, but I've been working on this over the last year, the question of who actually has property rights to the data that we produce, whether our own production of the data gives us a right to them, answer no, not in most legal system, no. You might get some privacy protection under the European directive, but most legal systems say that because these data have no economic value to us, we didn't improve them, we just created them. This goes back to what I said earlier. Um, we don't have a property right. Only those who have aggregated the data because they put some additional work into them, they improve them, they actually can claim that if somebody else tries to take the data away from them, it's hacking, they can control these data and use and monetize them. So we have seeing similar arguments, I would, I would say, in the digital code that we see, have seen in the legal code. Now, whether or not um, the digital code can really replace the legal code um, is not so clear. In the book, I still argue that um, probably we'll, we are seeing the legal enclosure of the digital code rather than the digital um, substitution of the legal code. I'm less sure today, I have to say honestly, I think that the digital code has enormous scaling power that does not rest with the centralized means of coercion as in the classic state 
and and law a state uh, law uh, law that is sponsored by a state story that I told or told all earlier. Um, digital coding can be done without any territorial boundaries. Um, you don't need um, the legal code. You might need some dispute resolution. We need to have some exit option from the code because we can't anticipate all future contingencies. But that's basically secondary to the enormous scaling power of the digital code. Think of Facebook was 2.5 billion users or so. You know that's beyond any territory. And then instead of coercive power, we actually have enormous predictive or surveillance uh, power. So the different way um, in which you can exert control. So this has, I think, the potential to create new kinds of governance regimes, the um, effects of which we haven't fully anticipated um, yet. Okay, so let me say a few words um, about globalization, then I come to the lawyer and then to democracy and I'll be brief. So one, one issue I want to raise um, is, you know, you may basically counter my argument by saying, all right, I'm t you know, you're telling us about the legal code of capital, but you're telling us this is all private law, private law is domestic law, which would suggest we could have capital system at the domestic level, but how can we have a global capitalist system? So that's, that's the puzzle I want to pose here, right? Um, uh, how can we have global capitalism if the core ingredients of capital are domestic institutions of private law? And my answer to that is, well, in theory, you could have a system where a single domestic legal system basically offers the legal modules to whoever wants to use them, as long as all other states will recognize and enforce these modules. Then you have enough if you have one legal system that provides or furnishes these institutions. And I'm basically saying most of the globally traded assets today are furnished only or coded in the legal system of two countries, um, England or the UK, but I'm focusing on the English common law, not the Scottish civil law, but the English common law and the US in particular, um, the states of New York for contract and financial law and things like that, collateral law, Delaware, mostly for corporate law and to some extent the, the business trust as well. So we have a global system where most of the legal coding is done in two legal system for globally traded capital um, assets and all other countries have changed their so-called conflict of law rules such that they will be recognized and enforced in most other jurisdictions. That's how you scale a domestic legal system to the globe. It's much harder to do this through harmonization efforts, standardization efforts, look at the EU. Um, it's politically um, um, fraught to try to do this. And so the private sector has come up with the alternative solution, which is to lobby states to change their conflict of law rules and make it easier for private parties to pick and choose the law by which they wish to be governed. So in addition to the global financial centers in London and New York, we also have to recognize that the global law firms sit in these cities. And that's no coincidence. So I gave you only here in this list, the top 20 global firms of 2018. That's basically at the time when I was finishing my books. book. I think we can probably update this. It wouldn't look much different. It certainly doesn't look different when you look down to the, um, to the other 80 firms. They're mostly Anglo-Saxon firms. So in fact, globalization is really the globalization of Anglo-American legal practice. Um, uh, there are reasons for that. I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A. Common law fosters legal innovation in particular enables private parties to claim superior rights over others through a decentralized process without having this uh, to make this politically contestable. And that gives the common law an edge over the civil law system. Uh, on top of that, the US with its federalist system where all of the private modules, legal modules I talked about are state law levels by basically playing out legislatures and courts from these different jurisdictions against each other. Um, this has been a powerful uh, incubator for uh, learning how to do regulatory arbitrage. And of course, we have legal education, including my own law school. We are, we're training uh, thousands and thousands of LLM students who bring the ideas of how you can code capital back to their home country and then learn how to transpose these skills into different legal systems. Okay. Um, so I should just add to that this is because of the central role that lawyers play. I call them the masters of the code of capital. So most lawyers that you meet will tell you, oh no, that's not what we're doing. We're just in the packaging industry. We're just packaging the claims that our clients want to protect and we're making sure that they do this within the law. And I'm basically saying, you know, you're doing much, much more than that. You're really without you, none of this would be possible. You might be serving a client and you might not be doing this on your own, but without your help, in the coding of capital, none of this um, would be possible. 
Okay, and that of course then raises the, the final um, issue here that I want to just briefly touch upon. It. Um, how do we square our idea of having self-governance within a polity, which is actually defined by a territorial bounded state, with the ability of those who have the resources to do so, to pick and choose a lawyer that will help them to pick and choose the laws by which they wish to be governed. And I've had debates in the past um, about the fact that why, what's wrong with being able to pick and choose the law by which you wish to be governed. And my response typically to that is that um, I think the law is a social, um, uh, a, a social asset, if you want, a social good, not a private good. And if we want to govern ourselves um, collectively as a democracy, we probably have to limit the options of some to opt in or opt out as they see fit. Um, so I think the, um, the excesses of the coding of capital, I wouldn't say that everything that happened is wrong. Some people would even have argued to me that this is really a success story, not a critical story that I'm telling. But the problem, of course, is we have created wealth for some who have the protection of the law, law being a social resource, which have been basically has been privatized to a large extent, still using the authority of the law, the legitimacy that it bestows on people, and yet leaving many of us um, without similar tools and many much more exposed to both um, economic um, uh, risks and, 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 and economic cycles. And of course, we're seeing this also enhanced now uh, by climate change and other, other, other issues. Um, I have a couple of uh, suggestions in the book about how to you know, think about rolling back the power of capital. I don't want to go into the details right now because I think we're running out of time. Otherwise, I just want to make sure that we have enough time for our discussion, but I'm happy to go over some of them. Just going to open this um, slide. The punchline is, is really that I'm saying, you know, this is not um, a case of a revolution or a wholesale transformation. In fact, um, such transformations very often happen at the surface and don't, don't dig deep enough. Um, I reviewed Piketty's most recent book about um, capital and ideology. And he writes in this book how shocked he was, how fast after the French Revolution, um, the levels of inequality had reestablished themselves in France. And I'm basically saying, well, no surprise, right? By just chopping off a couple of heads and changing the institution at the top, you haven't really dug deep enough to think about how these institutions are created that promote um, inequality. So I think we have to dig deep. And so we also have to find ways to get at that level. And I think we can do this effectively only through very well targeted interventions that take away the punch ball, if you want, from those who have the greatest interest in coding capital to enrich themselves. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing maybe so we can have a better perspective here. Uh, th th thank you so much. Uh, th that was a wonderful, very, very uh, concise, precisely focused uh, presentation. Um, I see a number of people lining up uh, to speak, but I'd like to abuse my position, if I may, uh, to ask an initial question. Um, so uh, your story of the role of law it, um, has as a central place in it the, the need for uh, the reconciliation of, of disputes or dispute arbitration or arbitration or so and you, you need a state actor in order to do that um, and that's presumably also the argument that you're you're going to make about why uh, the data revolution and the digital revolution isn't powerful enough to change that. But then at the end, you express some kind of hesitation. And you thought that the digital story might actually be more transformative and might not be capable of being enclosed. So it, it seems to me what's at the center of that discussion uh, is exactly the question of the need for arbitration uh, or the need for dispute resolution. And that's a long standing uh, issue. Um, so you know, in a sense, uh, Aristotle dealt with that uh, a long, long time ago. Um, and uh, that kind of Aristotelian thinking went really deep into the late antique period and the, uh, the Middle Ages. And you had uh, communities of merchants um, who dealt across very, very long areas uh, without really requiring any arbitration mechanism or resolution mechanism. Uh, because simply um, 
And you know, the logic of it is quite interesting. And uh, uh, so some economic historians have had a nice time investigating this, um, that with repeated transactions, um, you, you build up a reputation. And uh, so you don't want to do anything that will destroy that reputation. And so as a result of that, you can think of self-generated arbitration panels uh, that will handle disputes rather than arbitration or dispute settlement that's from the outside. And I, I wonder, um, you know, since reputation and uh, uh, exactly these kind of immaterial things that are core to that argument are so prominent in the digital world, you can lose your reputation very easily. You can, you can, uh, corporations can easily lose their reputation. Uh, so whether you think that um, uh, this might be an alternative of a different way of thinking about it uh, that uh, gets you away from the centrality of the law. In other words, you know, is this another form of the existence of capital without the same kind of legal structures as you're thinking about? Yeah, no, thank you for this question. It's, it's a great question. So my response to what that would be, you can have a lot of um, private dispute resolution, such as arbitration, um, that works on reputational me um, mechanisms, mostly because um, you have um, a limited network of people who participate in that. So I'm thinking when you said, you know, economic historians have uh, worked on this, like Afna Grief's work or also Lisa Bernstein. So Afna Grief himself, I think, has shown in, in his book that he later wrote that the Maghrebi traders, they were worked really well because this was a network of ethnically homogeneous middlemen and they had their own dispute resolution amongst them and yet they would shun people who would not play by the rules and not allow them to participate in the network. That works as far as the network goes. It never went into the hinterland. So it worked within the Mediterranean. It never worked into the, with the hinterland. So the, it was limited in scope and scale. And Genova, which came up later, created institutions that actually could be scaled because they put state power behind that. The point about dispute resolution, it has to work not only between the two parties, it has to have third party effect in the end. That's what the state is for. You can resolve a contractual dispute between the party, but making an announcement that a particular right that you have have created have also effects against others who were not part by part of the deal. That's a different story. And I think this third party effect is really what where power res resides and where we have to think about what institutions, what arrangements can create this. So the state has done that. I think since Genova, it's really been collective institutions that put their power behind that, um, that helped scale economic relations by doing so. And then we forget about this because they we could say, well, this is just private dispute resolution. We're doing today so many big transactions all through private arbitration. Well, why does it work? Because every state has a law, and this was lobbied for, of course, and we have an international convention, the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of International and Foreign Arbitral Awards, that says states that are a member of this uh, um, convention will enforce the rulings of private arbitral tribunals. So here we go, right? So without that enforcement backstopping, I don't think arbitration would ever have this power. And what frightens me is the extent to which we're actually privatizing dispute resolution. Think about employee relations in this country, forcing employees into a private setup where they have not the kind of procedural protection they would otherwise have. And the state backstops that by saying, and we will enforce it. If the, and we will enforce it. That's the kind of division of labor that we have. And I think that goes for, forward. Um, and that, that sort of enhances, I think, the role of capital. Final thing about digital, I think the digital world, they're learning that they need human input for dispute resolution because they can't pre-code everything. But how they bring the human input in and whom they appoint for this human input, I think that will tell us how much this is democratic or is ultimately driven by those who are controlling the digital code themselves. And um, if I could just give a follow up. Uh, so you, 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 you had on your globalization slide, I think rightly, the centrality of the United States as a financial center, the centrality of the United States as a legal system. Um, but you know, obviously this is also an area where there have been changes in the past. Um, uh, you know, Genoa was once the great financial center. Venice was the great financial center. Amsterdam was, London was. Um, and uh, you know, there's, there's little that's left. Um, and many people think that we're at exactly the moment where the kind of center of geoeconomic gravity is, is, is shifting to Asia. I mean, can you imagine a Chinese version of exactly your system? 
I don't think it's impossible to imagine this, but I think what I find more likely is sort of uh, that we, we that we basically go digital, right? That you have the Facebooks of this world controlling a lot of um, social relations and increasingly economic relations. Think Amazon, etc. And you know, Facebook has already built its own court um, and uh, has you know committed to be bound by them. You know, you have to realize, of course, that Zucker, Mark Zuckerberg is sort of uh, running Facebook like an authoritarian regime, so that doesn't really look democratic. But there are new forms of power. Are, I think emerging that we have to take seriously, but China, I think, with you know, China is doing basically in lockstep digital power and political old, old school um, uh, political authoritarian regimes, and that's a pretty powerful mix that's going to be difficult to dislodge. So, so, so yes, and capital will go there if they can get what they want. Capital is footloose. We have created a system where it's no longer committed to the US. It can switch. And once you get better protections from a different legal regime, it will switch and the lawyers will be on board with that as well. Okay, thank you. And so I, I'm just, just looking at the question list now. Um, are there some specific changes in private law which you believe would promote greater income inequality? So uh, it's from Kathleen Hurley. Uh, some specific changes in private law which would promote greater income equality? To, well, one is that you basically make it more difficult to use private law institutions such as the trust or the corporation to protect assets against claims, including tax claims or claims by others, whether these are taught claimants. Think about pollution and climate change, right? Um, the corporation has the feature to not only separate the assets from the assets of its shareholders and to protect it from shareholders and their personal creditors, it also gives shareholders limited liability, which basically means that investors do not price in the risk of a company ever being held liable for pollution uh, because they will, you know, they can just walk away with the gains they made in the past and, and reallocate their, their assets. So one suggestion that I've made when I was in Davos in January and have written an op-ed about is sort of to strip limited liability of firms that are intentionally polluting the environment and creating a lot of tort victims. Um, it's very difficult to, if you, even if you can enforce a claim against the company, you can't against, go against the shareholders. So that's one way uh, to do this. And there are other parallels. You could also say, you know, limit the accessibility of the trust and other types of vehicles to hide your wealth um, and thereby uh, protect it from too many claimants, including but not limited to tax authorities. Uh, next question, um, anonymous this time. You mentioned that capital is mostly related with private law, but doesn't its direct relationship with inequality make it also strongly related to public law? Uh, the, the, the person who posed this question said, I would like to know if this is developed in the book or whether you're focused much more on the relationship with private law. I focus much more on the relation with private law and, and the reason is because most um, studies of, on inequality, they basically say, okay, the system is as it is and we're doing only redistribution exposed, treating basically everything that become, comes at the forefront as, or at the, at, the, at the front end as sort of natural, right? That what happens in private law is just people have skills and they make money and it's fine and then we redistribute through tax law. We take care of externalities by imposing some regulations. Well, I'm basically saying, you know, we're basically giving a license to externalize with limited liabilities to corporations at the front end without taking this into consideration what you regulate will always be only a fraction of what you have given away already at the front end so i think my concern and i wanted to basically fill this gap that in most of these debates nobody talks about the private law um, most people talk about public law and you know when i talk to uh, practitioners in new york quite a few have told me that you know they can easily get around um, public law uh, constraints by using the private law you just go into a different legal system you take another their asset shield to trust a corporation, you create new types of structures that protect you from the impact of public regulation. So unless we understand this interplay, I don't think we can make much headway just relying on, on public law interventions. Uh, thanks. I, I've got another anonymous um, question, um, which goes like this. It, it appears that the law operates within the context of pre-existing inequality and heterogeneity. It isn't clear that inequality can be placed squarely at the feet of the law, yet the law may certainly stabilize the status quo, either exacerbating inequalities or ensuring that individuals do indeed have equal rights. The issue then is about the system of making law and who gets to write it. Um, well, I, 
I, th I think that's basically your thesis. So I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you want to answer that more or... Yeah, um... yeah let, me, let me just clarify. I think it's a good point. There's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem as in all you know, accounts of a causal claim um, in a way. And I'm basically saying, uh, you know, we have underestimated the role that law plays in creating uh, wealth and inequality. I grant you that the property rights, as I suggested, as Rudden has said, the property rights were created by the feudal lords for themselves. Right, and they had basically their sons sitting in the courts and 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 recognizing these rights, and they were then enforced. We have, of course, legitimized that and say it's legal. And it's a legal system that we treat as relatively neutral. Right, everybody is equal formally before the law and can use it. And in fact, people have different access to the law. And when you look at the fees that lawyers take uh, nowadays, and these fees you have to pay to get the best legal advice to you know create your own new assets and protect those that you have had in the past, then it is a question of resources and access to them. But it's basically an intertwined relationship. And um, uh, what I'm basically trying to say here is, yes, if you had better resources at the beginning, you had a much better chance. But this wasn't necessarily outcome determinative. I think you can point to legal systems such as the civil law systems, which have limited the ability to which private parties can use the law and the enforcement power of the state in just to enhance their own private wealth. So there are, there are alternatives to that regime, but I think the particular regime that has become so dominant has had the competitive advantage of giving private parties so much power. Great, many things. That's actually a nice bridge into, there's a whole group of questions. So I, I would like to cluster them about the global south or developing countries. Um, how could so-called developing countries escape the international pressure placed on them to adopt the code of capital, should they or can they reject participation in the system? Uh, and then uh, Sergio Shaparo asks, uh, what initiatives do you know for advancing uses of law that serve communities better, including indigenous people from the global south to protect their lands and their knowledge? What kinds of initiatives uh, should a lawyer who wants to use her knowledge in the benefit of communities and not the corporation, uh, what should she look to? Yeah, great question. So there's also something that is really, really on my mind because I, I, you know, I, I teach law and development. I've been teaching it for many years. I typically worked on developing countries and emerging markets, and I wrote this book about the core countries of capitalism, but also for a reason. So what is, does it mean for developing countries? I mean, one thing, of course, think about the doing business index of the World Bank, right? That's an index that basically tells countries, developing countries, to create the legal foundations for coding capital and leave it mostly to private people. And if they get that right, they get, they're getting better ranks in this index. And so they're better promoting um, business. And that's, and, and that also is, you know, it helps them to access loans from the World Bank and other agencies that are taking a look at that as well. So the World Bank, certainly since 2003 or four, when they first came out with that, but arguably earlier, has very much promoted legal reforms that make it easier to code capital. Getting away from that is not easy because if you're dependent on external sources of finance, it's important to have the blessing of the World Bank. So, so there is a whole um, issue here. There are people who have argued otherwise, and there are people on the grounds in, in many countries that are suggesting other types of legal reforms. Let me just um, suggest also how the law can be used positively and has been used positively, but maybe with a double-edged sword. In my book on the coding of capital, I actually started the entire enclosure and legal argument um, story with the story of the Maya of Belize, who had exercised um, for centuries um, use practices of the land and then finally went to court, to their own domestic courts, to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, back to their own domestic courts to claim that their use practices should be recognized as property rights. That's actually a very revealing exercise because, first of all, the courts in Belize simply didn't hear their case, denial of justice. So they went to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, which said, actually, under the convention, this is a property right, you ought to protect it. But, of course, the convention is not binding on the Belize courts. So they went back to the Belize courts and the Supreme Court of Belize ultimately said that under the Constitution of Belize, I think it's from 1987, Belize became independent very, very late as a British colony, at least um, uh, was it before it became independent. The Supreme Court of Belize said that the Constitution's language suggests that even use rights that are not capitalized, they're just used to preserve the way that these people live, are recognized as a property right. And therefore, the state is basically expropriating the Maya when they take licenses and give it to mining companies to use the resources underneath their ground to mine the land. Now, the government has never really felt bound by that court ruling. So they basically um, not observed what the Supreme Court of 
Belize had told the government. And that tells you something too, is that the government has a tendency to back the kind of rights that seem to be profitable, even for the government, for licenses, for tax purposes, for economic development understood as a capitalist economic development. But there's another story you can take away from that, or another argument you can take away from that story is that other kinds of interest could be coded with the legal institutions that we have. Property rights properly understood, not only something that is of economic value, but that is freedom enhancing and preserves the autonomy, the self-authorship, as Hanoch Dagan in Israel calls it, the self-authorship of individuals, could be understood differently and give many more people a claim against private parties, also against um, the state. The trust, the much maligned trust, which I malign in the book as well, can be used and is being used to protect the business interest of, let's say, organic farmers to make the transition from one generation to the other and still preserve the purpose of this business, not having a sellout to a big um, um, agribusiness company. So many of features of the institutions that I described could be used in different ways. It requires uh, both political acumen, legal coding techniques, and I think a different philosophy about what these economic activities are all about and how we should protect them. But I think it's feasible. Even with, if we just take the modules of the Code of Capital, we could do a lot. So this is a sort of follow-up question on that, um, and it comes from uh, Federico Suarez, uh, who, who is a professor at the uh, Externado de Colombia University in Bogota, um, and he's there with his class. Um, so he's asking, and presumably his class is asking, what useful advice could you give to young students located in a developing country like Colombia, which aims to use their legal studies to reflect in new avenues to tackle inequality? Yeah, no, I think the first thing is really to really know what the normative foundation is of, on which you want to stand and what you want to do. So it's basically the question, do we want to tackle inequality and what legal means do we have at our disposal to do so and where can we get where can we make sure that the uh, coding techniques that we might develop and use are actually going to be um, recognized by enough state power and others so that we can really make a difference so that is um, contingent on different legal systems on on different institutions in different countries but um, what I would say is you know we, we, we can use the beautiful thing about private law is how malleable it is and in even in civil law system it can be used quite flexibly you can substitute the trust for a foundation you can create collective use rights mechanisms by combining um, a partnership structure with a limited liability com company structure if you're imaginative so I think the point for me is to really learn how these um, legal institutions work in a given context, what courts, let's say, in, in, in Bogota might um, be recognizing or not, and then harness that power for the purpose that you want to pursue. That's have, how the coders have always done that. And I'm actually arguing in the book, we should take a page out of the script of the coders of capital to see how we could recode. Uh, they do the same thing. You just push for a particular agenda and you use legal institutions. You're trying to reinterpret them by pushing the limits of the current interpretive boundaries um, and, and, and thereby create um, new legal institutions, not from scratch, not just from a design because people won't recognize us. Take what we have and then reapply it, recombine. Well, well thanks. That, that actually feeds into another question that I've got on the list uh, from a uh, local question from Leanne Hewitt in, in Princeton. Um, and uh, she wants to know, how does your analysis lead to a reassessment of patent law, trust law, uh, what, what precisely would you do to refigure trust law and patent law? Yeah. Now, these are two very different types of legal entitlements because the patent law still requires that somebody who wants to have a patent goes to um, the U.S. US patent office or an, you know, the European one or a local one to get their property right. This is where you see most explicit how important state power is, right? The US constitution says we protect property right, never defines it as most constitutions do. They presume it. They presume the pre-constitutional state of what they will protect. This goes back to the earlier question. It was there already when they started protecting it. But for intellectual property rights, the US constitution says, and Congress can adopt laws. So this is a political move to adopt the laws and then it's a judicial move and a, a question of the court structure to make sure what kind of um, rights will really be recognized and enforced. In the book, I tell the story about the BRCA um, uh, gene for breast, uh, breast cancer and how a firm was able to capture a gene and then run with it for 
basically 20 years before the Supreme Court struck it down. And in the meantime, had created this huge database, which they then could um, use to generate even more money. The point here with a patent is the states actually have the authority to say, no, you can't. You don't get a patent for that. But the US has been enormously liberal in the open sense in recognizing anything that is um, um, uh, manipulated by some human as, as patentable. And I think we have to roll this back. That has to be restricted to limit the monopoly rights that we give with a patent and to harness innovative capacity that others have. Trusts are slightly different um, because trusts have evolved such, well, that's how they were created in the first place, that you create a contractual arrangement that has property rights implication. So you don't have to go to the state to get approval for your trust structure. You're basically writing this up like a trust deed in the offices of a law firm. And when somebody comes and challenges a particular claim, you pull out the trust deed and say, lo and behold, this is a trust and here's the trustee and you don't have any rights. So, you know, I don't think you can easily get away from the trust again. Um, an English king, I forgot when it was, I think 1394, so struck down the use, which was the predecessor of the trust, which had also been used widely for tax evasion. And as a result, the lawyers reinvented the whole thing and now we had the trust. And now there's an inter international convention so that civil law countries can access the trust. So it is so attractive for so many powerful uh, folks that I think it's difficult to rein it in. Where I would start is to say, well, let's just then roll back the tax privileges that we give trusts by treating them as a pass-through um, instrument and even in the real estate context, giving them additional tax benefits so it can, can be used for the capital um, coding. So for each of these instruments, I think we have to be really clear as where is the power of the state and where can the power of the state be mobilized to take away the uh, relative comparative advantage that co um, capital coders have. I mean, it sounds as if the power of the state is actually quite circumscribed. There was one question about why don't revolutions do more in the way of overthrowing things? But the example you gave is a nice one because uh, the King of England uh, you mentioned was uh, King Richard II. Um, and within a few years, uh, he was deposed and uh, was then murdered by the people who deposed him. Uh, so, you know, even the king can't do anything really. Um, yes. it, it, can we switch gear a little bit? Although it's still in the same kind of direction, but it, it, yeah. it opens up a radically new front in this discussion. So I would like to uh, take this one uh, from, um, uh, where, where is it? It's uh, um, from Alvis Foboda. Uh, does having a single source code make a modern legal theory analogous to modern monetary theory? Could the American legal system enable the creation of new popular legal rights internationally? Um, I, I, I don't know quite what the question means, but m maybe uh, you, you, you let me, sense yeah, of an let me tell, yeah. between modern monetary me, theory and uh, modern yes. legal theory. Yes. So um, let me start on modern monetary theory. Um, so as you know, the current monetary system that we have is hybrid, right? It's, it's deeply hybrid because we have not only state issued legal tender, we have a lot of private claims that private institutions such as banks and shadow banks, increasingly with shadow banking practices in, in, in create. And of course, the, the, whole, the whole system of the hybrid uh, um, institutions that we have basically says the banks can create new claims that are ultimately also denominated in dollars. And ultimately, they will be dollar claims. They will try to convert this back into dollar, which is one of the reasons why we have these many, many frictions in the system. Now, Modern monetary theory, there are different people who talk about this. So I, um, I took a closer look at Stephanie Kelton's book. She doesn't really talk much about private money. She mostly talks about the fact that the money creation is, uh, is, 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 is a power that the state has and that it can use it in different ways to fund itself. It's basically a way to source the state rather than, and it doesn't need taxes from the people. It uses taxes only to make sure that everybody uses the, the, the legal tender that the government has issued because they have to pay their taxes in that, in that tender. So, but there are people like Robert Hockett and others at, at Cornell who have thought, basically done the next step and said, okay, how does this all link together with our current um, uh, financial structures? And one way to think this through is to say, as he does, um, uh, that you could actually uh, eliminate the middlemen, the banks who have basically been, uh, you know, the parasites of the system that was always backed by state power. You create, you know, digital Fed accounts for everybody directly with the Fed, right? So that you have a deposit 
that doesn't need to have deposit insurance anymore because you have it directly with the Fed. If the government needs to helicopter money, they can do this directly. And then the question is, of course, you know, where does the credit come from? You can still have private banks that can issue credit, but they don't have direct access then to, to the um, state money. And, um, uh, and so you could separate more payment systems from the credit generation um, and can um, uh, impose the risk of creating additional credit on the institutions that do so. Um, so there's, I think, there, I think more work has to be done in MMT on the intersection between how money works and how credits work and what the institutions are that play a role here. I don't think it has been fully worked out, but I think there are interesting lines of, of, of research ongoing and practical experimentation, right? Bob Hockett was behind a, a bill that um, was introduced in the New York parliament, hasn't been passed, but the idea is that you could also create kind of state-like money, we don't call it money, but some, something similar. So we can have a decentralized system of digital wallets where we can exchange claims um, in a way that is productive for many and doesn't exclude so many from, from the payment system as so many are underbanked in this country. I mean, that, that has been tried in a number of uh, quite limited areas. So the uh, city of Bristol in the UK has been doing that. Yeah. So the Chiemgau area in the south of Germany has had its own... Yes, and Chiemgau. Switzerland is doing a little bit of that, yeah. So we're seeing more of that, yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, so fr from um, a a Adriano Cardoso Enrique, um, a kind of really fundamental question, uh, wants to know how is it possible, how would you do it, to couple human rights or moral arguments to the code of capital. Yeah, basically, you know what what um, what I'm saying in the book, and actually, a philosopher from Germany um, has reinforced this. She wrote um, a contribution for a special issue about the book, and she says, under, under any moral theory, what is happening um, in practice that I describe in the code of capital cannot be justified. So um, what I would argue is that actually, you know, if we want to harness the powers of the state and back certain types of um, interest, I think we need a normative theory to do so. And just saying it's efficient and somebody can make money and hopefully we will all be better off down the line is just not sufficient because it hasn't worked like that and it won't work like that. And so we have to have, be clearer about where the norms come from. The intersection is of course also clear in some of the rights that I discuss in the book, property rights, right? When the Maya went to the International Commission of, um, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, rights. They basically said, we have a human rights to have our use practices recognized as a property right and defendable against the interest of uh, mining companies that are getting a license from the government. And I think here we have to be just much clearer. It was a difficult decision for the, for the court to reach because the language is so unclear in the constitutions, but we could make a much stronger claim what the purpose is of these rights that we want to back as societies, because it's a social good, loss of social good, and we're basically putting our power behind that and which ones do we want to really empower and which ones do we not want to empower so much. There are many other intersections and when you think back about sort of the um, Alien Torts Act in the United States, how people were using the Alien Torts Act to bring human rights claims basically to US courts and then the door was shut by the Supreme Court. But again, you can very imaginatively use um, coding strategies for different purposes to get similar results as the coders of capital have done in, on a much larger scale. I, I don't know whether this, this relates to it. I mean, this may be a slightly different angle as well. Uh, Asgir Torfesen asks, if the capital is moving and escaping from US law, where do you see it moving to? Well, I think historically there's always been this competition between UK and US law, and you can see this in you know, the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, and the financial industry in particular has excelled at sort of basically um, you know, threatening one jurisdiction with moving to the other if they don't give them what they want. And um, it's not that hard to see that you could um, find for finance in particular some other hubs. Um, uh, you know, Singapore might be a little small, but it's certainly one of the jurisdictions that might situate itself in a certain way. I don't think it's beyond China to say we will protect financial interests if they can attract a lot of financial intermediaries to China and get them under their control. So there will be compromises to be made. 
so ultimately, I think the coders of capital will go where they can get the greatest flexibility to use the legal system. They don't even have to go physically, right? They just go and use that legal system and scale it up. So how far can you scale it? They all go to the Cayman Islands for corporate law. Many, 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 many companies do this already, right? So it's not all the US slightly overstatement, but I think the tr traded assets are actually mostly US financial law. I think the you know, to counter that, what, what will have to happen is that individual uh, countries will have to stop recognizing and enforcing all these claims that are coded in legal systems for purposes that defy their own normative principles. So rather than giving a blank check and saying we will enforce anything that comes our way just because it's English or New York law, or we will enforce any arbitral award by any kind of arbitral tribunal, no matter what they said and whether it's consistent with our norms, I think we need more control. And so we have to empower the courts and other law enforcement agents to exert that kind of control. That would make it harder for capital being so footloose. But I think I'm basically saying they're roving, it's roving capital, they can find the jurisdictions and by promising some returns, some capital investments, they can get enough jurisdictions to offer them um, what they want. And finally, I were gradually running out of time, but one last question. Uh, normatively, from an anonymous attendee, normatively, how should the law balance social wealth equality versus social wealth maximization? Do you have any normative guide on what, how that trade-off could be handled? You know, that's a, it's a hard question. Um, it's, of course, you know, if we say social wealth maximization is without thinking about the distributional effect, um, and given the amount of wealth that we have in the world right now, I think the priority for me right now, given the discrepancies and the fact that so many are really struggling with survival, would be to put a premium on, on, greater, on greater equality and greater distribution. Um, I'm not sure this is a, you know, you could always say you always are in favor of distribution rather than sort of the potential to create more wealth. But I think my, my point of critique would be, would be to claim that at any level, as long as we can just increase the pie, it's got to be fine and we don't have to justify more. I think if we increase the pie and we change our laws and make it easier for some to increase the pie, we also want to know where the returns are and how the returns are being distributed. And that's basically why I would ask the questions and put the burden of proof, I say this in the book, the burden of proof have to be, has to be on the side of the so-called social welfare maximizers. That not only is this really maximizing social welfare, not only today, but 10 years from now when the financial system is blowing up, but also what are the distributional consequences of what we're doing? And then, then we can have a discussion about the deeper underlying norms. Well, thank you so much. I mean, clearly, uh, this is a beginning of a discussion, and uh, you've really opened it up in an absolutely brilliant way. Um, a wonderful book. Um, and uh, I, I think it's going, it has already, but it's going to uh, spark off a lot of interesting uh, discussion at a moment when things, in a way, are more open than they were just a few years ago. So it's, it's a good discussion and at the right time. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you, you, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate also the many attendees and the questions that I received. So, and you can send me an email or follow me on Twitter and let's have a conversation about these issues. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.